So far, we've been dealing with uh, the stationary scattering states when they're very far away from uh, the target or very far away from the, the range of this interaction potential. Uh, to get into some insight into uh, the behavior of the scattered wave in the presence of the potential, we're going to reason by analogy from one dimensional scattering. So we'll consider the situation where we have uh, some incident particle uh, going towards a non-zero potential that is limited over here by a hard wall. So the particle can't uh, cross this barrier over here because there, it has infinite potential. By conservation of probability, we have to require that uh, any scattered wave has to have uh, the same amplitude as the incident wave. So I'll write it over here, there's more room. It's traveling in the opposite direction and it can only differ by a phase, which by convention we write as two delta. And part of the reason for that is because if this scatter wave didn't have the same amplitude or the same value for its square modulus, we would have an accumulation of probability somewhere over here. And there's no mechanism to allow for that. So if we added amplitudes, then this would be A, and this would also have to be A. And this is... Uh, for X uh, in this region. So within the range of the potential. Okay, so if we extend this idea to the three dimensional case, uh, we have our incident wave was represented by a superposition of partial weights. Uh, each of these uh, partial weights is an independent solution to the Schrodinger equation. So technically speaking, each of these partial waves independently uh, scatters from our potential. So this is... Um, independent of the others that are making up our incident wave. And that means if we denote the scatter one by uh, this little tilde, this means that each scattered partial wave, which we'll denote by psi not uh, L, this is our L partial wave, the tilde it denotes the fact that this is the scattered one this takes it's got the same uh, angular dependence in general and the outgoing uh, partial waves must have picked up an extra phase shift which we'll denote by two delta L. The L is a subscript. Relative to the incident uh, waves. So this is the incident partial wave. This is the outgoing 
partial wave with this added phase shift that we reason must be there uh, by analogy to the one dimensional case. Then combining the effect of all of the partial waves that are uh, incident and scattering on our target. Okay, so we combine all the partial waves to build up our, uh, the total wave that was representative of our scattering stationary states. Um, So there's a, a factor of 2i k over here. This is over all L. I've separated the uh, complex exponential with the phase shift from this term here. This is a little tight, but this term over here is what we had up here is e to the minus i k r minus l pi over two over r. So this is the expected form of our wave uh, within the range of our scattering potential. And this uh, has to match our asymptotic form. So for R much bigger than A, which was composed of our incident plane wave. And the scatter one. So the, the idea now is with the uh, partial wave representation of our asymptotic scattering stationary states that we showed in the last video. We have to match this expression to this expected expression that we deduced from uh, this insight that the scatter wave must have a phase shift relative to the incident wave. And to differentiate them, we'll put a little tilde on uh, the form of the wave function and the range of the potential. Okay, so what we have then is our wave function in the range of the potential has to eventually converge with the wave function that we had uh, kind of postulated when we're very far away from the potential. So this means
So this is our site tilde. This has to match. This is the spherical wave representation of our incident plane wave, plus the representation of our scattered wave. In terms of these partial waves, or in terms of the with the scattering amplitude expressed as a linear superposition of the Legendre polynomials. Here we can see right away that the incident partial waves on both sides cancel out. So that's this term over here. We'll cancel out with this term over here. Okay, so the incoming waves are this term and this term. Then setting i to the power of l equal to e to the i pi l over two by Euler's identity. These two expressions are, are the same. And we have So this is our new left-hand side. It's this part simplified by canceling out the incoming waves and plugging this in. And our right-hand side. These part, these terms are not functions of L, so we can remove them from the sum and factor them out and they cancel on both sides. So that finally we're left with the following. So this is our new left-hand side. And this is our new right-hand side over here. We can see that uh, these terms match on both sides. And for these two expressions to match, this e to the i delta l has to match this expression over here. So 2i k a l. This is the same thing as saying AL, so our, the amplitude of our partial wave that we were looking for from the last video is equal to e to the 2i delta L minus one over 2ik. We can factor out 
and e to the i delta l. to get that AL has to be equal to this. And remember that the whole point of this was that we had expressed the scattering amplitude as a linear combination of the Legendre polynomials where we were looking for uh, these coefficients a l. We now have a form for these. So in principle, if we can find the value of the phase shifts due to the scattering process, we have a solution for the scattering amplitude. And by extension, uh, the total scattering section. Since if we integrate over all solid angles, uh, the square modulus of our scattering amplitude, we get the total scattering cross section. And this can be shown to equal four pi k squared, 2L plus one sine squared delta L. So this is the main result of the method of partial waves. We can uh, estimate the total scattering cross section if we're able to find the phase shifts in our scattering process. In general, there would be uh, infinitely many of them, one for each L. In certain cases, uh, for example, in low energy scattering, you can focus only on uh, certain L values. So for example, you can look at only L equals zero and you only have a single phase shift uh, to calculate. So we've completed our exploration of the method of partial waves for solving uh, scattering problems for the case of a central potential or a spherical symmetric potential.